Jesus came to earth and laid aside his princely crown. Came to his creation, yet a room could not be found. At this special time of year, the call is heard anew. Will you hear his pleading? Let Christ be born in you. Christmas in your heart. Make it Christmas in your heart. Open wide the door and let Jesus in your heart. As the Savior knocks today, will you call the turn away? Christmas, make it Christmas in your heart. You may sing the carols that exalt the baby's name, but when Jesus calls to you, the answer's still the same. There's no room for Jesus. He is Christ. If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 John chapter 5 for a few moments. 1 John chapter 5. We are going through the book of 1 John. I've enjoyed it thoroughly. We're in the last, last book now. And uh, I just hate to see uh, it end. So I might just uh, take my time on chapter 5 so we can just enjoy the ride. Amen. Enjoy the, the study of the Word of God. Uh, around here we let the Word of God preach. And just let the, we'll let the Word of God preach. And and it's not our opinions or our illustrations that count. It's what God's Word says. And this morning I'd like to preach a message entitled, um, How to Know How to know That You've Received the Gift of Christmas. How to Know That You've Received the Gift of Christmas. You know, the gift of Christmas is one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. He came to this earth uh, looking for you. He came to this earth when we couldn't come to Him. And the Bible says He came to seek and to save those that were lost. And folks, we were all lost. I was a son of a drunk, didn't have anything to offer God, nothing to give Him. Uh, I, I wasn't worthy to be saved. And the Lord found me at the age of 11 and a half years old, and I got saved, and I ain't never regretted it. Pardon the bad English. I'm glad I'm on the way to heaven. And it wasn't anything I did. It's what He did at the cross of Calvary. But I'm sure I'm saved. I'm not cocky. I'm just confident in the Word of God. And I know for sure that it changed my life. I was preaching when my daddy was 63 years of age. And he got gloriously saved. And he lived seven years. Strosa's liver got him. Died a terrible death. And on his deathbed he said, Wayne, I got one regret. And I listened very closely. It was a week before he died. I said, what is it, daddy? He said, I really regret one thing. He said, I wish I'd have got saved at an earlier age. Because I've only lived seven years, from 63 to 70. And so he said to me, he said, hey, tell all the young people, get saved early. Don't waste their life uh, on drugs and drinking and sin and, uh, you know, just being religious. He was at church every day or every time the doors opened because mother said he wasn't going to eat Sunday lunch unless he came to church. So he'd rather eat than, than starve, amen? And so he went, and he listened to the gospel, and thank God he got saved. 
But the Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, in verse 12, it says, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. In other words, it is existing. Brother Jason, I'll have the privilege of uh, preaching Walker County Jail Tuesday morning. Uh, Brother uh, Steve's a new chaplain now, and uh, we're going to be over there preaching and giving gifts out to the prisoners on Tuesday morning. And, you know, they're just marking time. And I want to say this, friend. If you're not saved, you're just marking time. Because the Bible says, here it is, he that hath, verse 12, look at it. 1 John 5, 12. He that hath the Son hath life, he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. So you really start living when you get saved. And I want to tell you something, I'll, I, 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 I'm telling you, the worst day I have is better than the best day of somebody that's lost. You know, and, and it's urgent. Like I preached last Sunday night on uh, knock on doors for the fire's coming. And I thank God for, and we have, we have three or four firemen here this morning. I thank God for the first responders. And folks, I want to tell you something, the fire is real, it's eternal hell. And folks, somebody needs to tell them that there's a way out. And they need to get out of the way of that, of that wrath to come. Jesus took our fire. Jesus took our hell. Jesus took our sin debt. Jesus took our place. He's our substitute. He's the Lamb of God. And thank the Lord for it. Let's stay in all the Word of God. 1 John chapter 5. And I'll read verses 1 through 5. It says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is, is Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth Him that begotteth loveth him also that begot, uh, is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. We're not here because we have to, we're here because we want to. And look at verse 4, it says, For whosoever is born of God, there's five or six times that's mentioned, maybe seven in this book of 1 John. And here's the birthmark, overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? I skip on down to verse 13 to save time, because I know that I'm the only thing between you and lunch, so I'll try to lay it on the line and do it quick. It says in verse 13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. This chapter starts with believing on the name of the Son of God. The Bible says that you can know you're saved by believing on the name of the Son of God. And folks, it's not just believing about, it's believing in. I believe about this guy named Khrushchev, or whatever his name was down there in Cuba. And, but I don't believe in him, or I'd be a communist and follow him. And I, folks, I believe about uh, uh, you know, uh, several people, Stalin and others, but I don't follow them. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a follower of Christ because I believe in Him. There's a difference. You may be seated as I pray. Father, thank You for this precious promise of how we can know that we receive the gift of Christmas, salvation. That we're going to heaven and not hell. That we have our prayers answered. We have peace and purpose and joy and power over sin, Satan, and the world. Lord, we can know it. We can know it. Lord, I thank you for the no-so religion. Lord, the relationship of being saved. Knowing that we're saved, saved, saved. And Lord, it's a blessing. On this Christmas season, when we think about Jesus coming to this earth and being born in a manger, 33 years later, dying on a cross, three days later, arising from the dead, Lord, then 40 days later, seen of 500 men and uh, many witnesses ascended to heaven. And Lord, you said you're coming back again. And Lord, I thank you for that, that fact. But Lord, I pray that everyone in this room, including members of the Whitfield Baptist Church, are truly born of God, saved and on the way to heaven. And we'll thank you and praise you for that reality. In Jesus' name, amen. How can we know we're saved? You know, first of all, I want you to know that you're saved because it's a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not dead religion. Just because you're a Baptist doesn't mean you're saved. You can go to church by the way of the church pew. You can go to hell by the way of the church pew. You can be baptized, capsized, and Simon. 
You can be baptized so many times that you got webbed feet and still go to hell. You can join the church and still go to hell. The Bible says that we can know that we're saved and have the gift of Christmas because in verse 1 it says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is born of God. Folks, that Jesus is Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begotteth, begot loveth him also that is begotten of him. Now folks, there's two evidence of being saved in this first verse. First of all, it's a personal relationship. Whosoever. Folks, that means whosoever. And belief is the bedrock of salvation. There's only one sin that will cause you to miss hell, heaven. There's only one sin that will cause you to go to hell. And you say, what is that sin? It's the sin of unbelief. It's the sin of unbelief. Folks, the Bible says that Jesus is the only way. John chapter 14, verse 6 says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father but by me. Now, I didn't write that. Jesus wrote it. God's Word, 1,500 years, 44 different authors, 66 different books, not one contradiction. And all through this book, the theme is Jesus. The blood of Jesus cleanses from all sin. And folks, it's a personal relationship. The Bible says in uh, Acts 16, 31, the Philippian jailer, uh, the, 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 the earthquake took place, and here's Paul and Silas, walks out. He's about to commit suicide because in the Bible days, to let a prisoner go was the death sentence. So he said, well, I might as well just kill myself. And Paul said, don't do any harm. He said, we're here to tell you about how to be saved. And he said, what must I do to be saved? Acts 16, 31, Paul said this, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's it. That's simple, isn't it? The Bible says in Acts 4, 12, There is no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. Now folks, I want to tell you something. I'm not trying to be narrow-minded. I just want to be biblically minded. And the Bible tells us that Jesus is the only way. Romans 10, 9 says this, that if you'll uh, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God is raised from the dead, thou shall be what? Saved. Saved from a wasted life and saved from eternity in hell. John chapter 3, verse 3 says, and, uh, and you must be born again. That which is of the flesh is the flesh, but that which is of the Spirit is the Spirit. You must be born again. And folks, understand the birth of Christ you must be born again. What does that mean? And, and, and Nicodemus asked it in John chapter 3. You mean I go, go back in my mother's womb, be born all over again? He says, no, you must be born of the Spirit. You must be born of the Spirit. Just as Jesus was born of the Spirit by the virgin uh, uh, that had never been with man, Joseph almost put her away because he found her pregnant. And folks, and, and the Spirit of God told Joseph, don't put her away. This is of the Holy Ghost. And it's a divine conception. It's the immaculate conception, someone said. So folks, how many of you are born physically in here? Raise your hand. You're born, okay, that means you're alive, amen? <laughs> Some of you are saying, well, I'm not really sure, praise God. It's been a rough week. But I want to tell you something. You know, why do you, why do you know you're born? How, I mean, how do you know you're born? I mean, you were all there, but you don't remember it, amen? It was 65 years ago for me. Man, I'm getting old. But I want to tell you something, friend. I was there, but I want to tell you something. I know I'm, I was born because there's evidence. There's birthmarks, amen? I mean, folks, listen. One of the evidence of being born again is that, that you have a profound rearrangement of life. Look at verse 2. It says, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. So the first evidence of being saved is God puts a new love in your heart. God puts a love in your heart for this word. It's love letters from home. God puts a, a new love in your, in your heart for the church. It's where God's people gather together. It's like family reunion, praise God. It's wonderful. And we Baptists, we eat a lot, so we, we celebrate all the time. But I want to tell you something, we love the saints. And folks, the Bible says we know in John chapter 3, verse 14, we know that we pass from death into life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Folks, he puts a new love in your heart. And then number two, he puts a new, he, 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 you will not only live, love the saints, but you'll live out the scriptures. Look at verse 3. So, so this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. Hey friend, listen, I want to tell you something. When you get saved, 
Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things pass away. Pass away. I, I smoke as much as I want to. I do drugs as much as I want to. I drink as much as I want to. I run around on my beautiful wife that's sitting next to my beautiful granddaughter from South Africa um, as much as I want to. But I want to tell you something. Since I got saved, I don't want to. And I'll tell you something. Since I got saved, I'm scared to. Say amen. God put a new want to in my life. God put a new want to in my life. I want to do the things of God. I want to read my Bible. I want to be in church. And the Bible says this, you'll keep His commandments and they won't be grievous. Hey, listen, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Son of God is a personal relationship. And folks, we love the saints. We, we love Him. Uh, we love them because He loved them. And then we know that we love the children of God when we keep His commandments. We live out the Scripture. And we love the saint. But let me just say this, and there's another evidence of being, I mean birthmarks. Birthmarks that you're alive, that you're really saved, is found in verse 4. It says, whosoever is born of God. Now we're just reading the scriptures now, but it's right here. It's evidence. It's birthmarks. Your life's been rearranged. It's not only been rearranged, it's been birthed. And there's a new life in you. He's the Holy Spirit inside of you. It's a spiritual relationship. It's not some dead religion. It's not joining the church or getting baptized, even though you ought to do that once you get saved. But it says this, Who serves born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that leave, believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. There's that, there's that uh, criteria again, that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God. So as a believer... Uh, you grow in the Lord and your life's marked with a steady move away from the world. So you get more like Jesus. I'm not saying that you're going to be perfect. No one in here is perfect, including me. And if you don't believe it, ask my wife. No, don't ask her nothing. Amen? She might tell you. But folks, we're a new, crea we're a new creation in Christ. We have a new life. Passed from death unto life. We're a resurrected being. It's a life worth living and it's a life worth sharing. And so, folks, we know through, through, uh, through a, a rearranged life, a total new life, a changed life, a personal relationship with God. We're no longer parts of this world. We're just pilgrims passing through. And this world's not going to save you. The flesh ain't going to save you. Only one can save you is God. So the birthmark of salvation, we love the saints. We live the Scripture, and we leave the world. We leave the sinful world. Folks, we can't leave this world until God calls us home. But I want to tell you something, folks. We need to realize there's a clear witness. Let me just skip to this, and I'm going to close. Now, don't pack up, because I close and close and close. I love to close. Look at verse 9. It says, We see the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. Now, that spoke to my heart. We receive the witness of man. You know what that's saying? You trust man, why can't you trust God? By the way, last time I went to the doctor, I couldn't even read his writing when he wrote me a prescription. But I trusted him. Amen. Last time my wife rode with me, she trusts she trust her life in my hands. Amen. That's why you shouldn't text while you drive. That'll kill somebody, amen. You shouldn't drink while you drive. You shouldn't... You shouldn't uh, you shouldn't uh, sleep while you drive. Some of you do that. <laughs> but I want to tell you something, friend. You, you trust somebody with your life when you get in a car with them. Say amen. You trust somebody with your life when you go to the doctor. You trust a pharmacist when you go over here to Kmart Pharmacy. And they all know me personally. I've been up there so much. And they say, hey, here you go. Blah, blah, blah. They read something I can't read. And they give me some tall bottle of medicine for, uh, for my high blood pressure or or my bad heart, or whatever, I'm falling apart, praise God. But you know, and uh, you know, and I sit there, go home, read the label, take two a day, and it could be strychnine po poison for all I know, but I trust that pharmacist. Look at, look at the verse. It says, hey, we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. What is that witness? He that believeth the Son of God hath the witness of himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar because he believeth not in the record that, that God gave his son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. It's a record. Another reason I know I'm saved, somewhere I got a birth certificate. Said I was, I, I was born. 
My name's Kenneth Wayne Cofield. It's a record. Grayson, Georgia, where I lived the first three, three years of my life, they won the state championship last night. Hallelujah. But listen, friend, I'm going to tell you something. I got more than just a paper. I got the Spirit of God in my heart as a witness. I could read these verses, verses 6, 7, 8, talks about the Spirit, talks about the water, the baptism of Jesus. And the Spirit came down as a dove, and the voice of God said, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. I'll tell you why He was well pleased with it. Because He went to Calvary as a sinless sacrifice in your place and took your hell and took your sin debt, and that's the gift of Christmas. How do I know I've received the gift of Christmas? Folks, because I have a relationship. I got a love uh, for the saint. I got a life from the Scripture. And praise God, I'm leaving this old sinful world. Amen? And every day, we're getting closer to eternity, and we better be ready. But I want to tell you something. The Bible says, These things have I written unto you. Now, John wrote several books. 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. And he wrote the Gospel of John. So before he wrote this, how you could know, he wanted to show you how you could know, how you can get saved. I want you to turn back to a very familiar verse, John 3.16. And I close with this verse. John 3.16. The Bible has a wonderful verse here that all of you have heard probably. But I want to tell you something. I want to just sort of dwell with it just a little bit and give it to you uh, and, and break it down word for word. John 3.16 in the 15 minutes we got left. John wrote this. Before he wrote these things written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life, he wanted to give you how you can get in, how you can receive the gift of Christmas. Jesus Christ, eternal life. How you can go to heaven and not hell. How you can have a little heaven on this earth of prayers answered, peace, joy, love, purpose over sin, Satan, and the world. That's a great gift. You know, there was a front page of Pulitzer Prize winner, I think it was on the New York Times in 1948, and it, it was a beautiful tree, and under the tree it, it said, Untaken Gift. And under that tree was a wrapped present, and it said, John 3.16. went all over the world. Now everybody would try to argue about it and try to kick it off the front page because it had a verse on it. But you know, the untaken gift is, is found in this verse. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him, listen very closely now, should not perish, but have everlasting life. I want you to see this word for God. That's the author of salvation. He's perfect, He was sufficient, and He satisfied the justice of God, Jesus Christ. God who made the universe and all that's in the world offers you a gift. The God who made the way, it's a sure way, it's a perfect way, it's the only way, no other name under heaven. I am the way, the truth, and life. Jesus said that. He offers you, God offered His Son. And then I see not only the author of salvation, God, but I see the affection of salvation. So love the world. The fountainhead of salvation is the love of God. Let me say, first of all, it's unconditional love. In spite of all our sins, in spite of all our shortcomings, in spite of our wretched and ruined and unlovable lovingness, uh, He loves us. Isn't that wonderful? Folks, we don't deserve the gift of, of eternal life. That's what that wonderful grace of God, the psalm meant. But folks, the Bible says, the world was so blind that they received Him not. John verse, chapter 1, verse 11. He came into the own and His own received Him not. But verse 12 says, but as many as received Him... To them gave He the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. There it is again. Believing on His name. Believing in Him. So love. Getting saved, listen to this now, is a response to perfect love. Then I see third of all the agony. Not only the author of salvation, God. Not only the affection. Look at the verse. For God so loved the world that He gave. The agony of salvation that He gave. He gave His Son. The gift of salvation was wrapped up in agony. It was wrapped up in a lonely hill called Calvary. Everybody's heard about it. 
What a sacrifice. First of all, there was the physical part. In the garden, uh, he suffered. But folks, I want to tell you something. He was beat. He was, he was scourged. You know what a scourge is? Cat of nine tails. It was a whip with nine lashes. Metal, bones, um, rocks embedded in those lashes. They say the first one through 15 uh, of the lashes would cut through the skin and the fat of a human being. And then the next 15 to 25 lashes would cut through the fat to the muscle. Then the lashes would cut from the 25th to the 26th, 27th, on up to about lash 35, would go through the muscles even to the inner organs. And the last four lashes from 35 to 39, sometimes it would grab an eye or an internal, uh, an internal organ and they would die from the scourge. Well, Jesus didn't die from the scourge. They crowned Him with a crown of thorns. Three and a half, four inches thorns over in the Middle East. Not these little things on the rose bushes we have. And they blindfolded him. They spat in his face. They beat him. They mocked him. They said, you're king. Tell me who hit you. They put a purple robe of mockery on him. They put a sepulcher in his hand. They took that sepulcher, that rod, and they beat those, those thorns into his skull. And the Bible says blood was mingled with a spit after they plucked off his beard. Physical suffering for you. But there was more than physical, it was emotional. Because I want to tell you something, friend. His own people left him. There was only five women and one man that went to the cross. And folks, I want to tell you something. Listen now, this is very important. Don't be distracted. The emotional suffering was that he was alone. And his own people received him not. They said, crucify him! It's emotional when your own loved ones don't love you. But you know what the worst part of the Calvary was? For God so loved the world that He gave, it was a spiritual suffering. See, He took your sin and my sin. And he suffered the weight of sin. Our sins weighed much more than the old rugged cross. It was a dark day at Calvary, but I want to tell you something, it was a dark day in the garden when He saw all the sins of all mankind being poured upon Him. And He said, Father, Sweating great drops of blood from his forehead. He said, Father, if thou if thou if it be by the will, would let, let this cup pass from me. And he said, he, and, he, and the Lord changed his prayer and he said, Not my will, but thine be done. See, it was the will of God for Jesus to die in your place. There's a fancy word in 1 John, it's a propitiation, it means it satisfied God's justice. So, folks, we see the agony of salvation. That he gave his life. I want to say this, friend. The gift of Christmas is free for you, but it pay, it cost a lot for God. And it cost a lot for Jesus. He had to pay the price. He took your hell. He took your darkness. He cried out, My God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? Because God could not look on sin. He felt like God had forsaken him. He bled, he died. For God so loved the world that He gave. And then what does it say? His only begotten Son. There's the advocate of salvation. Listen to me now. Our sins are forgiven because Jesus Christ pled our case. He said, I will take your sin. He's the only advocate. He's the only substitute. He's the only judge because He's the only one that's ever been perfect that walked this earth. For the wage of sin is death. Someone had to die. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So look at it. Here's the advocate of salvation. His only begotten Son. Nobody else can die in your place. No preacher can save you. No pope can save you. No potentate can save you. No president can save you. Or president-elect can save you. Only Jesus can satisfy your soul. Only Jesus can satisfy the justice of God. It was a perfect sacrifice. When John was baptizing, he looked up and saw Jesus coming to him. He said, Behold the Lamb which taketh away the sins of the world. Look at 1, John, 1 Peter, please. Chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. 
Y'all know the verse, but I want you to look at it. First John 1, 1 Peter 1, 18. Y'all there? Amen. I had it marked, so I'll wait on you. It says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things. Redeemed means bought with a price. Set free. It says, redeemed with corruptible things is silver and gold. You can't pay your way into heaven. From your vain conversation received by tradition from your father. You can't get saved because your parents are buried out back. We don't have a cemetery back, out back, so that's not a good illustration. But you can't get saved on your parents' salvation. Look at this though. But with the precious blood of Christ. As a lamb without blemish and without spot. Folks, he's the only way. Folks, he's the advocate of salvation. And then I see the availability of salvation. Go back to John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever, whosoever means whosoever. Amen? That's deep, isn't it? Y'all came all the way here to hear that. Whosoever means whosoever. I just believe the Bible. Amen? And He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's the will of God for you to be saved. Romans 10, 13 says... Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Folks, it's a whosoever. I'm glad I'm a whosoever. Because when I was a son of a drunk and didn't have anything to offer God, He saved me just like I was. He came to me. I didn't have to come to Him. But I had to respond to Him and trust Him and pray and ask the Lord to come in my life at that day. It was the greatest day in my life. And that brings me to the next phrase. It says, For God the author of salvation, so loved the world, the affection of salvation, that He gave, that He gave, that's the agony of His only begotten Son, that's the advocate of salvation, but it says, the whosoever, praise God, that's the availability of salvation, but then it goes on to say, believeth, believeth in Him. There's the acceptance of salvation. Simple, isn't it? Believe means you believe the word of the giver. Wish I had a gift up here. They, they took it. But if I had this gift, say I wanted to give you this uh, song book, praise God. I want to give you this song book. I said, I'm going to give you this song book. This is going to be your song book. What would you have to do? You'd have to take it, wouldn't you? But then also she'd have to do something else. She'd have to believe the word of the giver. Now I'm either a liar or I'm a giver. Jesus is either lie, God's either a liar or He tells the truth. And He said, Whosoever believeth Him shall have eternal life. For God so loved the world that whosoever believeth in Him. And so it's a free gift, but you've got to believe the word of the giver. If you see a package back there that has your name on it, you've got to believe the word of the giver. You'll never receive it. And that is salvation. It's available. And praise God... It is so simple that people try to get baptized and try to join the church and try to get perfect. And folks, I'm glad that it's whosoever, but I'm glad that I can believe the word of the giver. There's a guy named Blondin. He was a typewrote artist. I think he was crazy. And he walked over Niagara Falls on a typewrote children. I mean, that's crazy. I'm about to fall off the edge of this platform. And he was, go he was going down over Niagara Falls. And he went back. And everybody came back and said, Hey, how many believe that he can take this wheelbarrow and go back over this, this tightrope, back over Niagara Falls? They said, Hey, we all believe. Woohoo, yeah. Got a standing ovation they believe so much. And he looked at one lady, one man and said, Okay, get in. See, there's the difference in believing about and believing in. Get in if you believe it. Trust Him. Put your whole weight. That's what the uh, word means. And uh, uh, Peyton, the great missionary of old, said he was trying to find a word and, 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 and this native came in and put it, put, put, uh, sat down and he said, boy, I'm glad I sat down and used the word. And he says, what's that word mean? He says, I put my whole weight on this chair. He says, that's the word. Believe it. means you trust Him with your whole life. You trust Him with all eternity. You trust Him with, with salvation. Heaven. Get in. You believe in Him, not about Him. 
And then we see the, the acceptance, believe in Him, but we see the alternative. Should not perish. Folks, the perish means hell. Jesus preached on hell 13 times in the New Testament. And if it's, if it's not real, I'm going to throw my Bible in the garbage, quit, and never preach another message. He, God inspired the writers, 66 different books, 44 different authors, to mention hell or a place of judgment 83 times from Genesis to Revelation. So, friend, we just can't take out what we don't like. The wage of sin is death. And the Bible says, fear Him, uh, fear, don't, don't fear uh, religion. Jesus preaching in Matthew 25, verse 41. But He says, fear Him that can take your soul to hell. You need to reverence God. That means you need to fear Him. That means respect Him. And folks, when you respect Him, you respect this word. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that, that whosoever believed Him should not perish. There's no alternative but to perish forever. It's either heaven or hell. It's either life or existing. It's either peace or turmoil. It's either the Lord or Satan. That's salvation. And then I see the abiding salvation in closing. But it says, but have everlasting life. Every moment one receives Christ, or the very moment one receives Christ, the Bible promises at that moment, you start an everlasting life. You put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. On March 15th, Brother Darrell, 1964, your birthday, my spiritual birthday. I don't think he was born in that year. but Praise God, I received by faith the Word of God, the God of the Word. And I'm going to tell you something, I put my trust in the Lord, and at that moment, I became everlastingly saved. He's not an ending giver. He's not going to take it away. He's not going to disown me. He's not going to divorce me. He's going to keep me. He might have to chasten me. He might have to whip me. He might have to correct me. But praise God, He'll never leave me or forsake me. Because the Spirit of God comes in your life the moment you get saved. And I want to say this, friend. It's everlasting life. Not perish like the old world, but live like Noah. Not perish like the Sodomites, but live like Lot. Not perish like the foolish builder, but live like the wise man. Not perish like the rich man who went to hell, but live like Lazarus. Not perish like the devil, but have everlasting life like Christ. I'm going to tell you something. I'm so glad that this verse means what it says and says what it means. That if you'll trust Him and believe in Him, you're going to have everlasting life. In the Vietnam War, there was a little boy named Kai. And his sister was hurt very bad. And they put her in a Red Cross tent. And little Kai uh, was summoned to come into the tent because his, his little sister was dying. And they looked at him and they said, Kai, will you give? Will you give? Your sister needs blood. Will you give? And in broken English, he said, I give, I give. They put a little cow on a table next to his sister and he began to take his blood out of his vein. And he looked at the nurse with tears and he said, Ma'am, when am I to die? When am I to die? See, he thought he was giving all his blood for his sister to live. And praise God, 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ gave all his life that you might live. And He loves you. And salvation is a perfect response to a perfect love if you'll only trust Him. Let me read the verse in closing. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Let's pray. Father, thank You for this gift of Christmas but it wasn't cheap it cost you your only son God and Jesus it cost you the agony of Calvary and the sin debt was put on your heart and it, you bore our sins and you took our place but I thank you for that love 
And I thank you that we can know so and that we can know because of what is written. And what is written is that you took our place. That you for loved us so much that you gave your only begotten Son. That if we'll trust you and believe in you with our heart, that we'll not perish but have everlasting life. What a Christmas gift. A guaranteed gift. A gift that won't wear old. A gift that will last and keep on giving. A gift in eternal life.